minutes. Before we sit down, let's pray. Uh, what, a, what a sense of faith in the room tonight. I tell you, I, I never take for granted the presence of God. Like Henry was saying before, we did a podcast with a dear friend of ours today. And, um, you know, this guy has an audience that is predominantly, they're not really believers that listen to him. And he said, I want to explain why I am the way I am and why I love my church. And we began to talk about the power and the presence of God. We talked about the tangible manifest presence and how he'd been in church his whole life, but it wasn't until he experienced the manifest presence of God that that's what changed him. And I hope you never take for granted that the power and the presence of God is in this place. And that as we lean towards Him and as we turn our affection towards Him, He's always here. And He wants to meet you tonight. And I so believe that God, if you're watching, uh, that God wants to touch you, whether you're watching online, whether you're standing in this place tonight. And so I want us to pray that this Word, I hope that every week you come expectant for God to do something in your life. And I know that this word will not return void, but that you would have open hearts, open ears, open minds for the word of God to deposit because I believe He wants to take us from glory to glory. He wants to take us deeper. He wants to take us to places we've never been before. And so Father, we thank You for Your word. Your word, Your precious word. Your word that guides us, leads us, teaches us, trains us, admonishes us, lifts us up, reveals mysteries to us. God, I pray that this Word tonight, Your Word, through the power of Your Holy Spirit that brings revelation, God, I pray that it goes into every single heart. And I pray that we would be drawn closer to You, God, that we would know You and be known by You. And so God, I pray that as we listen and as as we open our hearts, God, that You would speak to us. Holy Spirit, do what only You can do as You move across every heart and every mind. And as these words come out of my mouth, God, I surrender my life again and I yield myself to You to say, Jesus, use me. Use this broken vessel, this yielded vessel to You that loves You so much and wants people to experience You afresh. So God, would You do something powerful tonight? In Your Name we pray. Amen. Why don't you take your seats? Um, I, um, I, I, I actually shared this message a few weeks ago to our college students. And uh, yeah, so sorry guys, you're getting round two, but it always comes out different with me, doesn't it? And uh, you're probably here on the weekend and you heard it, but um, it was such a profound day. I actually shared it on Valentine's Day because I talked about, you know, it's always about love and relationships. And I feel like, you know, this, 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 this group of Belonging Co and those watching online, maybe you're in that season where you haven't found your life partner, your, your soulmate, the one that you spend the rest of your life with. And, you know, for so long, I, I think we, we long for a human friendship that's going to fill the void that's uh, in our lives to share life with and to to be that soft place to fall. I know for me, I I didn't ever think about, I wasn't one of those girls who was just desperate to get married. But when I was in um, ministry, I was in vocational ministry from the age of 21, ministry was hard and it felt, a, it was like a lonely road. It was a very, very lonely road of serving God. And I remember just crying out to the Lord saying, God, I want somebody to share my life with so he can be a soft place to fall. And I remember the Holy Spirit just saying that that you've always longed for friendships, Alex. You've always looked for friendships in people and you've always been disappointed. And I don't know about you, but you're always looking for that friend or you're looking for that partner. You're looking for that person in your life to be that friend. We all want that deep friendship. And yet God has been waiting to be that friend to you. 
And I know He's not tangible. I know He's not a three-dimensional person in your life. But when you find friendship with God in Him, He is better than any friend or any lover that you will ever have. And I even remember when I, I longed to have this partner in my life and Henry came into my life and, and I remember being so excited because I'd been waiting for him for a long time. We all know the story if you were at the relationships panel. <laughs> took a while. But when he got there... I remember when we were dating, there would be nights where we'd finish youth group, young adults ministry, and I just want to go home. And it's not that I didn't want to be with Henry, it's just that my relationship and my friendship with the Lord actually fulfilled me more than my relationship with Henry. And I've been married to him now 25 years this year, and he is literally the best human on the planet for me. He is the best husband that you could ever imagine. I mean, I had my 50th birthday last week and guys, he wrote me another song. That's four songs now in my life with him, four songs. And this song, literally not a dry eye in the house. He does a montage of my life on a video. I'm bawling my eyes out because literally I have the best husband on planet earth. And I'm sorry for all you ladies, but he's taken, gone. Um, But he just, he's so good. But do do you know how good he actually is? Do you know that he still doesn't fulfill me like Jesus does? Because I don't think anyone should ever take the place of your friendship with Jesus. He should be your first. He should be your last. I love that we sang about first love tonight. Because this is the place. You know, we're talking about building this year. We're building the kingdom of God, but we're also building ourselves And I believe in order to build the kingdom of God, we can't build the kingdom of God without first having friendship with God. Because I believe friendship with God, then out of that friendship comes obedience. It's that friendship and it's that love relationship that you have with God that enables you to be all that you're called to be. I think so much of Christianity is like we, we do good works for God, trying to attain His love and His affection and His friendship. And He says, no, 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 I want you to go the other way around. I want you to be in love with me. And then out of that flow, the works of God. But so many of us are like minions running around trying to gain God's attention and you know, do you have I done enough? Have I done enough? Do you love me? Do you do you see me? Do you receive me? And he says, I saw you when you were a filthy sinner, and I still loved you. But now I want to be intimate with you. Now I want to know you. You know, sometimes we can look at our Father in heaven and feel distant towards him. Like, how could he be my friend? You know, maybe you didn't have a great relationship with your earthly father, so therefore there's a disconnect with your godly father. But you see, in my Bible, God wants to show that he can be our friend. And you know, I loved my dad. I know I know I talk about him a lot. And this just past few weeks, I've really missed my dad. Um, there's, there's aches in my heart that come in ebbs and flows. And, and, and some days I, I, you know, I think fondly of him. And then other days I'm really weighed down at the fact that he's not here. And it's coming up 20 years that he's been in heaven. And, um, but you know, when he was alive, I, I, I was so caught up with my dad, like he was just my best friend and I loved him so much and he loved me and there were four of us in the family and I was the baby and um, you know when he was having his last few months of his life, we would all kind of sit around his bed and I would come visit, I I lived uh, in another state and I would visit as much as I could and um, I'd just lay on his bed and I'd just stroke his brow and I'd always just snuggle up next to him and you know, he would always talk fondly of me and be very proud of me. And so everyone was like, oh, you're the favourite, you're the favourite. And I was like, you know what, I'm not the favourite because my dad is one of those dads that's very fair, equal parts for all four kids. Like he bought us all our first car, he gave us deposits for our house, and he did everything in equal shares. He was just one of those fair dads. It was not that he had favourites, but what I learned about my friendship with my dad is that the more I drew near to him, the more he drew near to me. And I got more from him emotionally and intimately because I positioned myself to get more from him. 
And so this is how the Father wants to be with us. He wants an intimate friendship with Him. And I believe that when we have an intimate friendship with the Father, that He reveals things to us that He just doesn't reveal to every other person. There are secrets and there are mysteries and there are unveilings that He wants to give His sons and daughters who are close to Him so that He can know that He trusts your heart. You see, I have lots of friends, but not every friend gets the deep places of my heart because that wouldn't be wisdom. It wouldn't be wisdom for me to, if I met just somebody tonight and started to disclose the deepest parts of my heart. That's not a wise thing to do because I don't know this person. I don't know how trustworthy they are going to be with the information that I'm giving. I'm not gonna even do that with people that perhaps I've known for a while, but I don't have intimate friendship with. The people that get the deepest parts of my heart, the secrets of my heart, the cares of my heart are the ones that I've built trust with, built relationship with, are in close proximity with. And so why would God be any different? Oh, He loves us all. But even Jesus had levels of friendship. He had three very close friends. Then He had nine good friends. And then He had like an outer crew. And then He had a real outer crew. (laughs) Even Jesus had solid friendships. Peter, James and John, they were close to Him. John was known as the one that Jesus loved. He would often put his head on Jesus' chest. There was an intimacy, there was an ease, there was friendship there. He knew Judas was gonna betray him. He was in his inner circle, but I don't think he was maybe giving everything to everybody. Even Jesus had levels of friendship. And I think God even shows us in the Bible that there were some people that he shared his whole heart with and he was a friend to, And some, not so much, not because He doesn't love you, but because He needs to trust us. See, Psalm 25, 14 says, The secret of the Lord is for those who fear Him, and He will make them known His covenant. To fear God, to have an awe of God, to have a reverence of God, to to, to understand that to be in His presence is a mighty weighty thing. I hope that, you know, some days I get a little bit nervous about how we can just lower Jesus to my bud, like my, you know, my pal, my mate. And yes, Jesus wants to be intimate, but make no mistake, don't ever lower His majesty to being a familiarity. Be careful that we can have people in our lives. You see, I I couldn't be chummy chummy with my dad. He wasn't that type of guy, but there was absolute intimacy there. But there was absolute fear of my dad of disobeying him. And it's interesting because how my dad received love was through obedience. He was more moved by when we obeyed him than when we just said, I loved him. He loved me because I was the daughter that was mindful to not break my dad's heart. And I remember this one time I did break my dad's heart. And I remember being so broken to see how broken he was to when I did something secretive behind his back and he found out and he was so broken that it broke me. Oh, that we would be children that when we find out that we break the heart of God, it's not because He's punishing us, but that we've broken His heart. See, this is the friendship that He wants with us. He wants this friendship that's deep and intimacy, and He wants to reveal secrets. He wants to share His heart. What breaks His heart should break ours. What He holds dear, we should know what holds dear. This is when we become holy and set apart. Not when you're trying to follow a checklist and and be His minion and do the religious uh, rituals. He's not after your sacrifice like, that he's after your obedience he's after an obedient heart there's nothing more moving than when your children choose to obey you because they love you my heart is moved when my kids obey me not because I am a hard taskmaster but it shows oh my kids honor me 
And this is the Father. He's not doing this so that you will obey him. But what happens is obedience is very consistent and synonymous with love. You cannot love someone and break their heart. Like that's him. Well, you can do that, but that's not love. See, to love someone is to honour them. To love someone is to serve them. To love someone, it's not just lip service. It's not just, oh, I love you, Lord. I just love you, Lord. I really love you, Lord, but I'm living my own way. Oh, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. But oh, I'm ignoring that conviction of the Holy Spirit. Oh, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. But oh, no, this is going to suit me. Oh, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. There's a scripture about this, you see. In Matthew 7, 21, it says, Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the... And Lord, Lord is an affectionate term because it's a repetitive Lord, Lord. Not everyone who tells me that they love me and that they're affectionate towards me will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in Your Name and drive out demons in Your Name and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. Sheesh. That's Jesus speaking. Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, I love you. I love you. I lo- there is nothing worse than somebody saying, I love you or I'm sorry, and nothing changes and you still break their heart. It's actually a slap in the face. And Jesus sees this and he says, But those that do the will of my Father, those that know me will obey me, those that love me will do what I have asked them to do. You see, why was Saul rejected as king and David appointed as king? Saul was rejected as king because he didn't obey God. David was chosen as king. Why? The Bible says in Acts that it was known that Jesus said, uh, God the Father said of David, that I chose David, son of Jesse, a man after my heart, because he will do what I ask him to do. Saul did what he wanted to do, but still sacrificed to the Lord. Oh, he did the religious thing and got the things and and sacrificed to the Lord. But God never asked him to sacrifice those animals. He actually asked him to kill those animals. But Saul thought he would do the super spiritual thing and say, well, let me get all the best animals and I will sacrifice them to the Lord. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the ones that do will do the will of my Father. It's not okay, guys, to sit here and go, I love you, I love you, and then love yourself during the week and forget about God. And then we wonder why we're not intimate with Him. We wonder why we can't hear Him clearly. We wonder why there's a block. We wonder why we're depressed. We wonder why we're full of anxiety because we don't actually know Him. And if you really want to know Him, read His Word and obey it. William Barclay is one of my favourite theologians and he says this about that scripture that I just said about not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. He says there are two great permanent truths within this passage. There is only one way in which people's sincerity can be proven and that is by their practice. Fine words will never substitute fine deeds. There's only one proof of love And that proof is obedience. There's no point in saying that we love a person and then do things that break that person's heart. This is very serious to me because I believe the church has lost the fear of God. And because of that, we've lost the awe of God that when he asks us to do something, we flippantly just brush it off. And yet what God is wanting to do in and through us is not make us His workers, but 
be part of a family that pertains to blessing because we purely love him and out of that love relationship we actually see incredible things on the other side of our obedience see I think we're more in love with ourselves and yet we give lip service to Jesus I've said this before but you know I was told by Joyce Meyer that you cannot have the two these two words in one sentence if he is your lord you can never say, no, Lord. It, it, it just doesn't make any sense. Because if he is your Lord, then it can only be, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Here I am, Lord. Ready, willing, and any. Here I am, Lord. Ready, ready, willing, and available without hindrance or distraction to do anything that you would ask of me before you've even given me the assignment. It's yes, Lord. It's a yes from me. You see, this is the heart that God is looking for in his children, a heart that obeys, a heart that yields. Faith without practice is a contradiction in terms, right? Faith without works is dead. And love without obedience is actually impossible. Love without Obedience, I see it as we're infatuated with God. There's a difference between love and infatuation. You see, the definition of infatuation is an intense but short-lived passion or admiration for someone. An intense but short-lived passion for someone. Short-lived. It's intense for a minute. It feels all the things for a moment, but it's short-lived. But love, love endures. Love remains. Love builds. Love's an action word. Love says, I will deny myself because I love you. When Henry and I were dating, um, I used to uh, punch him in the arm when I was excited about something. I know it's very weird, but you know, if you've ever seen Seinfeld, I know that I'm old and I watch, anyone watch Seinfeld? Thank you. Oh, Seinfeld still lives. Anyway, and Elaine would always hit people, right? Like, oh my gosh, that was me. And um, I would always do that to Henry. And Henry at one point was like, love, I really don't like it when you hit me. And I'm like, yeah, but that's how I express myself. I'm like, I'm doing it in fun. I never hit you out of anger. It's not like I punch you. You know, it's always in the arm and it's always, I'm so excited. I just need to share it with you. And he's like, yeah, but it hurts. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah, but, yeah, but, you know, but that, that's just me. And isn't that just sometimes so us? Well, that's just me, God. That's how I express how. So I don't raise my hands because that's not my personality. And I don't clap because I'm conservative. And, and we do all these things because it's more about me. Well, that's not love. Because if my boyfriend, who's soon to be my husband, and we're going to actually make a life together, if I choose to keep punching him in the arm, that's a form of dishonour because he doesn't like it. But I can be indignant about it and be like, yeah, but that's me and that's the way I express myself. And if you don't like it, then you don't love me. Rather than I love you and if that hurts you, I'm gonna refrain from doing that. It breaks your heart. I know it's a funny little analogy, but it's one that we need to understand that we do this with God all the time. Well, this is just me, or I am just this way. But you see, true love says that I will honour you and I will choose you every time. You know, Abraham in the Old Testament was the first one to be called God's friend. Could you imagine that? Being written in the Word as God's friend. I'm like, oh, so amazing. It's like Job. You know, he chose Job because there was no one righteous. Like, like could you imagine? He, he literally scans the earth and he says, there's no one like Job. What, like, consider Job. There's no one like him. Imagine God knowing about you so much that he's like, consider my servant Job. He won't sin. He is honourable. I know his character and integrity. 
Same with Abraham, known as God's friend. How do we become God's friend? And I thought about Abraham and I thought, you know, back then, you know, we didn't, he, they, the Old Testament, they didn't have the Holy Spirit like we have the Holy Spirit accessible to us. We didn't have the ease of the Holy Spirit. We didn't, you know, they didn't have the whole Holy Bible in New Testament, Old Testament form. They didn't have podcasts. They didn't have all of these things that he could reference. He had a relationship with Almighty God and yet he believed God and he was in full agreement and he was full of faith and that is what was credited to him as righteousness because he chose to believe God with the impossibility of what God had said to him and it was without question he had faith in God. You see, there was an obedience to yield to God's Word and say, I trust you, even though it doesn't make sense, even though it seems ridiculous, even though my body is as good as dead, even though I don't know where I'm going, I trust you. You see, I think that delights the heart of God when we have faith. And the Bible says in Hebrews 11 that it's impossible to please God without faith. Because faith is the currency of heaven. Faith says, oh, I trust you and I know you to be who you say you are. But when we have unbelief and a lack of faith, we're basically saying, you're not really God. And then we put ourselves in that position where we think we're, we know better. So what faith does to God is like what any little child does to their parent is when they throw themselves and jump off a, a, a high rise, knowing that their mum and dad's going to catch them. It delights the mother and father. Why? Because they know this child's fully abandoned to throw themselves and know that they will be caught. They're not sitting there going, oh, are my mum going to catch me? Is my dad going to catch me? I don't know. I don't know. They're just like, ready. And that's what I think moves the heart of God with Abraham is that he has faith. He believes him. See, Genesis 26, 5, he's saying this to Isaac and he says, because Abraham obeyed me and did everything I required of him, keeping my commands, my decrees and my instructions, I will bless you. Because Abraham obeyed me, he chose to obey all my instruction, every decree, everything that was required of him, that's why you are blessed. That's why this covenant promise keeps going. Because again, obedience is better than sacrifice. Abraham first obeyed God when he said, leave your country and go to the one that I will show you. He was 75 years of age, guys. That's no easy feat. We didn't have you holes to move. They didn't have, it wasn't easy. And yet he didn't even know where he was going. And yet he gets up without question. Now he'd have been, his father had been asked to do this, but his father decided to settle. And so many of us go halfway and then we settle. But God says half obedience is disobedience. Because when I ask you to do something, I want you to go all the way. And this is what will show me that you truly trust me and that you love me because obedience is again how it moves the heart of God. And here Abraham says, sure. In Genesis 12, he leaves. He leaves his country, he leaves his people, he leaves his father's household and he goes to the land that he gets shown. In Genesis 15, God promises him that he is going to have a son born of Sarah and I, um, Abraham and his, he will be the father of this nation of Israel. And Pastor Josh so eloquently talked about that promise in the sky and he believed God, even though his body was as good as dead. And then he watched for decades, waiting for this promise and he didn't waver in unbelief. He knew that God would bring it to pass. So Genesis 15, we see an obedience to trust God in bringing a miracle. And then we see in uh, Genesis 17, God makes covenant with Abraham and asks him to be circumcised. Now, I don't know about you. Well, I'm a woman, so this just really doesn't apply to me. But I don't know what that would feel like. Pretty painful, I suggest. 
But at 99, he's not questioning God going, well, how about we just start it with the new babies that are born? Because, you know, they'll never remember. I'm going to remember this. I'm 99. But you don't hear ever, ever Abraham questioning. He's just obedient to be in covenant with the Father. He's left his country. He's received God at His Word. He believes God. It's been credited to him as righteousness. And now he follows through with covenant and he gets circumcised. So much so that he becomes his friend that when Sodom and Gomorrah was going nuts and and his nephew Lot and his wife and family were in this place of destruction, God is wanting to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And this is so mind-blowing to me that in Genesis 18, 17, he says, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm doing? What? What do you mean, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm doing? He is God. He can do whatever He wants and He doesn't need to talk to anybody about it. But if this shows me that He's His friend, He's like, hey, I'm about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Should I hide that from Abraham? Because I know he's going to be pretty upset because he loves his nephew, but his nephew's chosen a bad way. And yet Abraham comes in and has dialogue with God. And if you read it, it's so good because even though Abraham is his friend, he's very reverent to God. He says, if I could be so bold, I I hope I'm not crossing a line. But what about if there were 50 righteous? Would Would you wipe it out then? No, Abraham, I wouldn't. Okay, I'm sorry, if I could be so bold, can I... What what about 30, 40, 30, 10? And they go through the numbers. And I think about this all the time and I think about this dialogue that God of the universe, creator of the universe is dialoguing with Abraham because they're friends and Abraham's able to say, hey, what about this? Because I know you to be good and I know you to love your people and I know they're messing up, but what about? Oh my goodness, that fact that sometimes we pray and we don't even understand our position. And we're praying prayers in a hope and a wish when when you understand that you've got a right standing with God, that you've had faith in Him and that you obeyed Him and that you've lived righteously and you've been set apart. I'm telling you, the Bible says in the New Testament that if you believe in Him, And you do His will according to His way. You can ask for anything. And I think we ask too small because you see, when you're not in relationship with someone, it's really hard to ask them for something big. But when you're in relationship, nothing's ever too hard to ask. See, this is the difference. And God's looking And he's saying, who wants to be my friend? Because I'm offering it to you. But I really believe that Abraham and God bonded as true friends at this moment. C.S. Lewis writes a quote. He says, friendship is born at the moment when one person says to another, What, you too? I thought I was the only one. I don't know if you've ever met a friend and you've been acquaintances and the moment you become friends is when that moment of connection is established. I have a friend in this church that I met 10 years ago through my friend Mia and we sat across a kitchen table eating brunch and I knew I loved her from the first minute that I saw her but I wasn't friends deep friends with her. And as we got to know each other and spend a little bit more time together, I'll never forget the moment where our hearts tethered together. My friend Shelley Griffin has been uh, my dear friend for 10 years and it was the moment where we exchanged and found out that we'd both lost our fathers as young women. And I'm like, oh, you, you too. You, you know what it's like to lose a dad. I I don't meet very many people that have lost their dad. And so the minute that I knew that she'd lost her dad and I lost my dad, we began to exchange stories and there was a heart connection that became a tethered friendship because we'd had a moment. What, you two? I thought I was the only one. What, you two? You know what it's like when you're just wanting your dad 
to hug you and when no one else is around, you just want Him to say that I love you. My dad used to have this term of endearment with me and she would go, my dad would call me this and I went, my dad would call me this and I miss the fact that when I pick up the phone, he would say that word and I miss hearing that word and you have this moment because you've exchanged the same pain. Maybe it's some joy that you've exchanged or maybe you went to the same school or you came from the same town and friendship is born. The minute you say, what, you too? I thought I was the only one. And see, I believe when God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac on the altar was when they truly connected as friends. Here's Abraham His promised one and only son. A foreshadow of what Jesus was going to do. Thousands of years later, be sacrificed for humanity. And here is Abraham, who's been waiting on this promise for decades and now finally has the promise of seed for this nation to be birthed, the people of God, the people of Israel. And then one moment, whether scholars say that he was either 15, some rabbis think he was the same age as Jesus. I don't know, we won't know that, but we just know that it wasn't a little boy like you were taught in Sunday school, that he was like this baby brought up to an altar, but he was a young man and he'd been in this family and He was going to be the seed of this generational blessing. And then God comes to him and says, Abraham, I need you to sacrifice Isaac on the altar. And you don't hear Abraham negotiate. You don't hear Abraham ask, what on earth are you doing? You don't hear Abraham going, what? You gave him to me. You promised him to me. Why should I give him back? You don't hear anything. You just hear, Hanani, here I am, Lord ready and willing without hesitation or distraction to do whatever it is you ask me to do because I love you. And he took Isaac the very next morning and he brings him up to that Mount Moriah and he places him on the altar so assured of who God is that even if he were to sacrifice him, he knew God could raise him from the dead. Oh, what faith he had. And he takes him up. He says, God, you gave him to me, therefore I give him to you. Nothing is mine anyway. And God says, hold, hold. Now I know that you fear me, Abraham. Now I know that you truly love me. And guess what? Now I know that you get it. You too, willing to give up your son like I'm about to give up my son. And you had did it without hesitation. And Jesus says, I'll do it without hesitation. And God provides a ram in the thicket. And we all know the story that we have a beautiful promise that God's promise is still being multiplied even now. I'm sure there is a Jewish baby being born right now. And God's promise is thousands and thousands and thousands of years old. But you see what I love about this story is that Abraham was such a friend of God that he knew God, he trusted God and he loved God the giver more than the gift. And yet so many of us, we want the gift, we want the benefits of God, but we're not willing to obey God. When He asks us to give up something, we think He's being our killjoy. But He's saying, do you love me? Our invitation our invitation is to become friends of God. You see, in James 2, 21, I love that James is speaking about Abraham and he says, was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did not what he said. 
And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. If the band could come or the keyboard player. You see, I believe that God's wanting to be our friend. Always our Lord, but also a friend. Intimacy with God. Understanding to be known by Him and to know Him. But I've learned over the years, church, and I speak this message from a place because I've lived it over and over again. And I'm telling you, there is nothing more beautiful than obedience to the one that you love. It's not painful. I I posted something today that, you know, America has got this ridiculous dream of the pursuit of happiness. It's so anti-Christ. It's not happiness that we're in pursuit of. It's joy that we need. Happiness is fleeting. Happiness is dependent on circumstances. And that's why we've got a world so dependent on the next fix. What makes me happy? Oh, that related, God, can you make me happy? And then Tim Russ said in this next frame, he says, you know, obedience isn't happiness. Jesus wasn't happy to go to the cross. He was willing to go to the cross. He was obedient to the point of death. He wasn't happy about it. Oh yes, the joy that was set before Him, that's joy, not happiness. He wasn't happy about being slaughtered. He wasn't happy about having a crown of thorns on His head. He wasn't happy about being mocked and whipped and hung on a cross. He wasn't happy about being naked in front of His family. He wasn't happy to bear the sin and shame. But He did it because He loves the Father and He's obedient. You see, when I became a true follower of Christ, it's when I had to draw a line in the sand because I'd had a revelation that even though I got saved at 11 and filled with the Holy Spirit, I'd walk through life, but I truly hadn't given Him the Lordship peace. He was my Saviour and He was everything in that way, but oh, but I still wanted life on my terms. I still wanted life my way. I wanted the benefits of God without being obedient to God. And I was wondering why I was always in distress. I was always in a tussle of, oh, do I believe or don't I believe? Or do I wanna do this or don't I wanna do this? Or am I happy or am I unhappy? And everything changed the day that I had a revelation that I deserve nothing but the penalty of death for my actions. God owes me nothing. God owes me nothing. I'm a sinner. I chose my way. I got out of the covering. And the consequence of sin is death. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says. But the gift of God is eternal life, but we have to choose it. And it was that night where I had tried both sides of the coin and I was like, well, The world doesn't make me happy and this half-baked Christianity doesn't make me happy either. And God says, Alex, in order to have all of me, I need all of you. Not 90%, not 99%, I need 100%. And I remember the beautiful feeling of God in my bedroom, pouring out His love, not His condemnation. Pouring out more love than I could ever have imagined. The love that I was longing for and looking for in relationships, the love I was looking for in securing whatever it is I thought was gonna bring happiness. And yet it was at the moment of surrender and full obedience 
But I stepped over that line and said, I give you all of me. And I've lived my life for 39 years in total obedience. Recently, I uh, felt God say, pick up that word that Banning Leapshear gave you in May of 2020. I'd forgotten about it. I just was sitting in my prayer time and he said, pick up that word. I'd been praying for something that was heavy on my heart and he said, pick up that word. I began to listen to that word and he said, Alex, there's something on your heart that you've been praying and believing for. He says, it seems so impossible right now. He says, but God told me to tell you this. He told me to, t- he said to me, Alex is my friend. And because of my friendship with her, I will honour her request. And I just began to bawl my eyes out. And I'm like, oh, friend? You call me friend? I didn't even care about the promise happening. I was just lost with someone told Banning Leapshire. God told Panic that I'm his friend. And then I began to look at my life and I thought, oh, I see the pattern, I see the pattern. I, every time he's asked me to do something, even when it's costly, I've obeyed him. From the day that I gave him my life, I remember the first thing he asked me, he said, I want your relationship. I'm like, but I'm in love. He says, well, me or him? I'm like, you, straight away. Cut that off. I want your friendships. But God, then I'll have no friends. Me or them. Okay, God, it's done. My friendships. I want you to surrender and go to church as much as you can because I need you to grow because your destiny is in the house of God. I'm there. I was at the old people's prayer meeting. I was at the young people's prayer meeting. I was at the soca services on Friday. I was at the soca services on Sunday. I was at the midweek prayer. Because now my life was surrendered. It was obedient. You see, you don't get to be his friend by just leaving a country and going to the place that I'll show you. It's a life of obedience. It's a life of surrender. And I look at my life and I go, I wouldn't have it any other way. Every surrender, every obedience, every costly act, every time I've had to forgive, every time I've been asked to lay that down, every time I had to, we had to empty our bank accounts, every time we had to give everything away, every time he asked us, he asked us to leave our home and go somewhere where we don't know where we're going. And we obeyed and we obeyed and we obeyed and we obeyed. And it's the most beautiful thing to be a friend of God. I'll leave you with this. You see, there's something so beautiful about the Apostle John. I think he's my favourite disciple. Because he had an intimacy with Jesus that I want. People always make fun of John because he refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. I don't believe John said that in arrogance. I believe John wrote that because it's what Jesus said about him. I believe that Jesus said, John, I love you. John. You're such a good friend. Is it any wonder that John, he speaks about love like no other disciple? When people become new believers, we always tell them, read the book of John, even though I think we should read the book of Ephesians. Read both. And yet you read, First, second, third, John, he talks about perfect love, casting out all fear. 
And you see that Jesus says in John 15, He writes this, He says, You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because the servant doesn't understand the master's business, but I know the father's business and I'm sharing with you because you're my friends. My my command is that you love one another. And is there any wonder that when John's talking about perfect love, casting out fear, he actually talks about loving others. Oh, there's so much in that. But the thing I wanna get to is there is mysteries and secrets saved up for His friends and there's no coincidence that John is the only disciple that died of old age. They tried to martyr him, they tried to kill him, they couldn't. They tried to boil him in hot oil and he still lived. Who knows what he looked like when by the time he got exiled to the Isle of Patmos. He gets exiled in solitary confinement on an island that is rugged and rough. And he's by himself and he's alone and he is probably worn out and he's having to feed himself. Who knows the circumstances of this situation? Yet it's there that Jesus chooses to reveal the greatest unveiling of the book of Revelation of intimate secrets and mysteries to His friend. Oh, when I read the book of Revelation a couple of years ago through the lens of Daryl Johnson, I wept every single page because of the way Jesus is just revealed. I can't imagine, see John, He lay on Jesus' chest. But yet in Revelation, it says, chapter one, it says, when I saw Him, when I saw Jesus, I fell at His feet as though dead. You see, there was a reverence and an honour. There was no familiarity. Oh, there was just a King that had been raised from the dead. There was the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the majestic one that He had once walked with. But make no mistake, even though John was His friend, there was no familiarity that He would fall fall on His face as though dead. And yet Jesus so tenderly says, He placed His right hand on me and said, I'm the first, the last, I'm the living one. I was dead and now look, I'm alive forever, John. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand. And of the seven gold lampstands is this, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. He's like, write down what you see, John. Don't be afraid. I'm sharing my secrets and my mysteries. And I so believe that God is wanting to build a church. Not of church attenders not of Christians who come and consume God like it's their right. Oh, but disciples that are so in love with Jesus that nothing is too hard. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I believe this moment, whether you're watching online, whether you're here in this room, God's inviting you to be His friend. But there may be some things that you're gonna have to lay down. Maybe He's asking you to give a few things up because some things have taken precedence over your relationship with God. I love that David said this in worship, that we've put other things in place and Church, I just need you to understand the reason why you're riddled with anxiety, the reason why you don't hear clearly is because you're actually in disobedience. It's that simple. When you're still yielding to your will, holding on to 
my will, God, but not yours. I'm telling you, it's very, very hard to be in intimacy with Jesus. But when you abandon yourself and you say, Jesus, I want friendship more than I want blessing and gifts and benefits. Because out of obedience flows blessing. Because you first love me, I choose you. And if you're in this place tonight, and I'm telling you, I'm the first to respond every time. Because I want a friendship with God that goes so deep, so vast, so wide. Because I've known God to be good. My life, I look at it 50 years and I go, I cannot deny the faithfulness of God at every turn. And I'm dedicating the next 50 to live abandoned, unapologetically in love with Jesus because it is my highest honour to serve and obey Him. But oh, I look, look forward to the mysteries to the unveilings, to the secrets, to the moves of God that are wrapped up in heaven, to the things that are deep revelations that He wants to show us. And if you say, Pastor Alex, I want to deepen my relationship with friendship with God. Some of you are gonna have to lay some things at the altar. Some of you are gonna have to repent once again. But if you want friendship with Jesus, He's inviting you. This is not a salvation altar call. This is about deepening your friendship with the lover of your soul. And if that's you, would you stand to your feet right now in this place? Father, we thank You. God, we thank You for those sons and daughters, those watching online that say, Jesus, I surrender. God, I'm not satisfied with my relationship. It's, I know that you're my saviour, but I want to be under your Lordship. I want my friendship to be like Abraham's. I want mysteries and secrets. I want your heart revealed to me. Would you just raise your hands? I'm gonna get the team to sing over you and I want you to do your business with the Lord between you and Jesus right now. Hallelujah.